Okay, kia ora once again, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third of the Burns Lectures for this year. It's uh, been a great pleasure over the last few days to hear uh, Canon Dr. Cathy Ross speaking on the topic, Mission is, as an Adventure of the Imagination. Uh, this evening, uh, she'll be talking on the theme of mission and salvation. Uh, the next Burns Lectures after this will be held on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, the Wednesday session will be in Moot Court at the top of the Richardson Building, uh, which is several minutes up the road. And the Thursday and Friday sessions will be back in here. A particularly warm welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, online. And at the end of this session, you'll be able to ask questions by using the uh, Facebook Messenger uh, function. So before we begin this evening, uh, let's offer a short karakia. He honore he kororia ki te atua. He mangarongo ki te whenua, he whakaro pai ki ngā tangataka toa. Hanga e te atua he ngākau hau ki roto ki tēnā ki tēnā o mātou. Whakatongia to wairo e tapu, he afina he tohu tohu e a mātou, he ako hoki i ngā mahi mō te ahiahi nei. Honour and glory to God, peace on earth and goodwill to all people. Create, O Lord, in us a new heart, in all of us. Instill in us your Holy Spirit. Help and direct all of us so that we may learn what we need to this evening. Amen. Over to you, Kathy. Thank you, and uh, kia ora tātou. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your patience. And to those of you online, I think we've got the tech issue sorted. So tonight, I want to think about salvation. Another world is waiting, mission and salvation who then can be saved? And uh, I've entitled it Perspectives on a Lived Theology of Salvation Among Fresh Expressions Communities in Britain. So this paper, this presentation, is a result of some research that I did with my colleague, Dr. James Butler, last year. And we wrote this paper together, actually. Lynn said that, um, when she introduced me for the first lecture, that I like to co-write and co-edit and it's really great working with colleagues. I prefer actually uh, researching and writing with colleagues, with somebody, because you know two heads are better than one, and you have rich conversations, and ideas emerge even in the conversations that we have together. So James and I did this research and wrote it up last year, and looking at how salvation is understood in emerging communities of fresh expressions in England. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term fresh expressions, they are a form of church for our changing culture, established primarily for the benefit of people who are not yet members of any church. Or another word might be missional community. So there's a whole spectrum that's covered by fresh expressions. And if you're interested, you can look it up. There's a whole website that explains to you in a lot more detail. So as researchers and teachers, James and I are committed to paying close attention to lived practice in our theology and research. Our approach comes to the conviction that the lived practices of fresh expressions are themselves theological and speak into a wider conversation. And theological action research, which we are both committed to, sees the process of qualitative research as recognizing the interrelated nature of theological voices, particularly the four voices, the formal, normative, operant, and espoused. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but they're a kind of device to help us identify the theology embedded in practices. So the formal voice is the voice of formal theology. The normative voice refers to the scriptures, creeds, and official church teaching. The espoused voice is what a group says they believe, while the operant voice is the theology of their actual practices, the theologies embedded in the group, i.e. what they actually do. So as these voices are recognised together, new moments of disclosure can occur. So to pay attention to practice, we ran a focus group with members of a boxing community um, and we interviewed a member of a classic car community and we interviewed a member of a sewing collective. These are all communities led by people of faith, ordained and lay. The boxing community developed on an estate among those 
with a love for boxing. The classic car community appeals to classic car enthusiasts, and the sewing collective attracts commercial sex workers into city in the north of England. And we also ran two further focus groups with leaders of fresh expressions. All the names are pseudonyms, and the names of the groups have been removed. So when I refer to people's names, they are pseudonyms. So these are all, if you like, missional communities or fresh expressions. So over our years of teaching and being involved in fresh expressions, we have noticed a recurring question, which, but is this church? This has been a regular question, initially targeted at those articulating a theological basis for fresh expressions, and now more commonly aimed at those involved in fresh expressions as a call to justify themselves. It's interesting to us, however, that the question of salvation is not one that has been raised so frequently. Dutch missiologists Stefan Paas and Hans Schaefer, in a paper they wrote recently entitled Reconciled Community on Finding a Soteriology for Fresh Expressions, ask why there's been so little attention given to this question of soteriology in fresh expressions. And their suggestion that, is it a, that it's a combination of speechlessness about religion in Western secularized societies, theological embarrassment of an evangelical soteriology that fresh expressions have left behind, and a lack of deep theological pockets is persuasive. They argue that fresh expressions have a social or communal soteriology as does Philip Wall, Philip Wall, who has also paid attention to soteriology and fresh expressions. He adds that while soteriology, particularly within evangelicalism, has a strong otherworldly focus, fresh expressions also bring a present focus to salvation. And North American theologian Brian Stone makes a similar turn to a communal soteriology in his work exploring evangelism in a plural society. And he also argues it's necessary to avoid making the church subordinate to mission. So our, this presentation builds on this turn to a communal and present focus soteriology through this qualitative research project with members of three fresh expressions and then further discussions with leaders of fresh expressions. And here we reflect on the themes which arose in the conversations with our participants and then we draw out some insights for a communal soteriology. We begin by identifying this communal soteriology within the communities themselves and identify some of the key practices for this. We then turn to the fruits of this communal soteriology, exploring the difference these communities have made. And we address the question of whether this is simply a collapse into imminence and a contemporary well-being culture first through exploring articulation, and then drawing on one of the most significant themes to come out of these communities, which is prayer. And we conclude by drawing together the learning from these communities to discuss how a focus on lived soteriology offers a new perspective on the kinds of ecclesiological questions which have dominated the conversation around fresh expressions. So firstly, communal salvation. Many of the people we talked with in our research had had little connection with church before they became involved with fresh expressions, with these fresh expressions. Sarah from the Sewing Collective was a particularly interesting example. She had led a difficult and chaotic life. She'd struggled with addiction, homelessness, and self-esteem issues. For her, one of the words she used most in her interview was connection. And she comments, as much as life has been a struggle, it's been blessed as well. You know, because of my downfalls, I feel more blessed because of the connections I've made and other, I've made to the people and other people in relation to Jesus and God. You know, that connection helps bring me closer as well. For Sarah, the welcome and support she received were an important part, but what she kept returning to were connections. For her, these connections to others and connections to Jesus were interrelated and demonstrate an experience of a communal soteriology. This interconnected nature of the community, bringing people closer together and to God, was also noted in the boxing community. So Gareth commented, 
We'll keep it going, not only just for the boxing side of things, but also for the community side of things. And that there'll be a couple of people there that will keep it going for the faith side of things. It's not just one aspect. Relationships, God, physical and mental well-being, spirituality, all seem to overlap in the experience of the boxing community. There was not a strong focus on individual conversion, although some did talk about becoming Christians and a member had been baptised. In all three communities, it was the integrated sense of community, faith and life which was appealing to the participants. So a key insight from Pass and Schaefer is drawn from the loving first journey developed and explored by English theologian Mike Moyner. It identifies how fresh expressions often develop through a process of listening, loving and serving, building community, exploring discipleship, church taking shape, and then doing it all over again. This has been a helpful guide for fresh expressions as they have developed. Pass and Schaefer pick up on this process as valuable. Pass and Schaefer pick up on this process in their paper and claim that if, as Moina asserts, each stage of this process is valuable in its own right for community building not to be instrumentalized to the service in the service of making disciples, then these must be two sides of the same soteriological coin. Salvation is not primarily an individual experience, but a communal one, where the community journeys together and salvation is seen as more of a process than an event. Parson Schaefer summed this up quite clearly. The theological assumption is that God is at work, wherever a reconciled community is in the process of being created, and that salvation is happening wherever this is experienced. And this matched with how our participants understood their own experience. Sarah states, there's not one thing in particular I can say I've been saved from because it's an ongoing thing with me. There's a sense of growing in belief and as a Christian. And Gary from the classic car community says, I can't proclaim to be a strong Christian, a strong believer, but what belief I have is more than what I had just over four years ago. So understanding salvation as a process is not something new for the Christian faith and would be seen as a quite normal move away from a more conversionist approach to, to the faith. This emphasis demonstrates the ways in which these fresh expressions have moved from a salvation primarily focused in the future towards a focus on the present. As North American theologians Steve Bevins and Roger Schroeder write, salvation is something that is operative now as we live in the presence of God's grace and the Spirit through Christ, again explicitly or implicitly acknowledged. And yet it's something towards we, which we continually move in this life and into which we grow more deeply as we move beyond this life. What Pass and Schaefer go on to name, they say salvation first and foremost is about becoming a person, a more social being, somebody who is capable of living in loving relationships. And this was very clear in the conversations we had, that the change which has come about as people have participated in these communities has been a growth in loving relationships. And through and alongside these growing relationships, they have experienced growing closeness of, to Jesus. The participants identify these communities as unusual in a number of ways. In the boxing community, they claimed that it was more welcoming than any boxing community they had ever been to before. They are not awkward and intimidating, but spaces where you're greeted with handshakes and invited to participate. They are spaces where faith, spirituality and God mix quite freely with the activities they're doing, the relationships they are building, and as a result they seem to become places where people are able to be more open perhaps about family issues, mental health, addiction or other things going on in their lives. They are supportive communities. Again, these communities demonstrate Parson Schaefer's description of how these communities open up a hermeneutical space in which we can discover 
and explore God's salvation. They argue that it's a porous space where people learn to explore their nature as relational beings. Their conclusion is that the theological vision of God's mission is oriented towards the restoration of community. Both the sewing collective and the boxing community express this in their own ways. In the sewing collective, they say, more importantly, it's a place of acceptance and mutual support, where women can share and learn skills, create community through telling our stories, gain self-worth and self-confidence, find self-expression through creativity, flourish and be transformed through God's love. And in the boxing community, when you spent an hour and a half kind of sweating in the same room, it's kind of 10 other people, there's a kind of, a kind of leveling in that. And there's a realism of that and being able to, to kind of share and, and kind of the stories we've got and kind of in our own lives or kind of in the prayers all the time. Our qualitative research has enabled us to explore some of the ways in which this communal theory soteriology is mediated and enabled. So by rooting our account in the lived practice of these communities, we'll build on these insights looking at how participation opens people up to salvation, what that salvation looks like in their lives, how the holistic nature of salvation is expressed, and explore the significance for a communal soteriology's turn to prayer. So it was fascinating to hear how people were welcomed into these communities and the enthusiasm for their communities. Gareth and the boxing community told us, there's no other place that gives you the support, the friends, and pretty much it's like your own tight little family and you look after each other. It's always been like that. Sarah from the Sewing Collective explained that it was part of her extended family and Greg told us that the classic car community is exactly what he had hoped for in a community. He said it's not just well-educated people, it's the full spectrum of what you would call, what you would hope would be a community. So what exactly is it that underpins a strong sense of welcome, community, and the extended family? And how is this part of a soteriological understanding and vision? So from listening to our participants express their enthusiasm for these communities, we think there are two main dimensions to this. One we have called chit-chat or conversation, and the other was about seeing the world differently. So perhaps chit-chat or conversation sounds trivial and not very theological and maybe even less soteriological. But is chit-chat or conversation not at the heart of what it means to be together and therefore to be human? At the heart of being human is living in relationship with one another. Being created in the image of God means that we find our true identity in coexistence with one another. Our human existence is communal, not individualistic. So we are most human when we are living and participating in community, not living and experiencing life as an individual. We exercise and live out our freedom, not in splendid isolation, but in continual interaction with other human beings. This implies being together, engaging in conversation or chit-chat, listening to one another, sharing stories, opening ourselves up in mutuality and vulnerability. Our participants certainly love telling stories and engaging in conversation. Sarah confirmed this in her experience of the Sewing Collective, where she explained, when we come together in the morning, you know, we get the kettle on as you do when you meet as friends and God and whatever, and we sit around for just a general chit chat or how everybody is if anybody's got any issues, and so on, and so on. And then we try to have a little, a little bit of time, of quiet time, for prayer and reflection. Sam at the boxing community really reiterates this also. 
You walk in, everybody shakes hands, everybody welcomes you, you have a nice chat, a laugh before you even start training. You do your training and then you're there for another 20 minutes to half an hour at the end just having a chat. Conversation or chit chat seem to be at the heart of their experience of community. And it made me think again of the African concept of Ubuntu, which we talked about yesterday. And I think that concept might help us here. Ubuntu is a philosophy of life or moral philosophy rooted in the South African context. And it's best expressed in aphorisms and practices reflecting the oral tradition from which it emerges. It describes the interconnectedness or togetherness of all humans and that it's only possible to be a person through other persons. I am because we are. Furthermore, it describes dynamic interaction, the act of interplay of forces between the individual and the community. And finally, an Ubuntu ethic refers to the importance of values of generosity, hospitality, friendliness, compassion, and solidarity. And we certainly saw these values at work in all three communities. Barry found solidarity in sharing his stories and frustrations. He said, it feels like to me, anyway, a kind of safe space to share that stuff. It doesn't hurt that we have a few punch bags that we can take our frustrations out on when the need arises. Gary found compassion and comfort from an older member of the classic car community, he said, who would just talk to me. And it won't be just about talking about the cars, we'll be talking about our own restoration, about how things are going on between us. This level of sharing, solidarity and openness led to a depth of participation and mutual support as they engaged with one another's lives. The metaphor of restoration is very important for the classic car community. The leader there is very attuned to the culture and context of that community as he's a classic car enthusiast himself. And he's able to be bilingual and uses the metaphor of restoration to explain our relationship with God. He explains that just as they lavish love and care on restoring, restoring their classic cars, so does God love, lavish love and care in restoring his relationship with us, or our relationship with God and with one another. So conversation and being together seemed also to lead to increased participation. The leaders we spoke with all had stories of change when people became part of these communities. They told us of people who grew in confidence to such an extent by participating in these communities that they were on welcome teams, in one context in a prayer group in a gay bar, or involved in a youth project. Participation in these groups meant friendships, sharing stories, and openness to sharing mental health issues and finding support and acceptance. And we found it fascinating that two of our groups could be seen as stereotypically male pursuits, a boxing community and a classic car community. And yet what these men loved about them was the depth of sharing and participation. For the classic car community, the metaphor of car restoration was applied to personal lives and to the loving restoration of the whole person. And in the boxing community, it was about being in each other's corners. They knew that they had one another's backs. And what was most delight, perhaps most delightful and a revealing insight was how their own participation enabled them to see the world differently. Our participants affirmed that the world was a better place as a result of being involved in these groups. Sarah said, I think I can go in and be in a really low in mood. And by the time I leave, you know, I'm in a totally different place in my mental capacity of how I'm dealing with things that are going on at home or in my life. And Gary insisted several times that the world is a better place as a result of the classic car community, and he felt happier by participating in that community. After a final prayer in the car park, Gary said, last Saturday, out on the car park, you know, everybody was silent, and everybody listened, and that's all you ask for, because those individuals can go home, 
and just hopefully, as I did, start to feel that something might be better in this world. Surely this is a soteriological insight, that there might be something better. While these communities might be emphasising a present focus to salvation, there are signs that, that it remains eschatological. And perhaps the most telling soteriological insight came from Greg, who told us, I would say salvation is, for want of a better word, where you are complete. And we thought this is indeed a theological vision of God's mission as oriented towards the restoration of community and seeing the world differently. Is all this salvation, though, as Pass and Schaefer pointedly ask? The point is, of course, can this salvation be had without actually confessing Jesus, even if it is unavailable without him? They ask if entering the soteriological space counts as conversion if one has not confessed Jesus or believes in God. And this is a question and concern of many Christians still. But perhaps in some ways it's the wrong question, or perhaps we're coming at this from the wrong angle. Back in the early 1990s, over 30 years ago, South African missiologist David Bosch was challenging us to have a more comprehensive understanding of salvation. He wrote, never before in history has people's social distress been as extensive as it is in the 20th century. And this may apply even more, particularly in our current decades, in our current context of a global pandemic, increased isolation and loneliness, along with soaring levels of ment mental health issues and ongoing wars. Bosch believes that Christians are well placed to do something about these needs. He asserts, to introduce change as Christians into all of this is to, media, to, is to mediate salvation. And he claims salvation is as coherent, broad and deep as the needs and exigencies of human existence. We certainly found this to be the reality among our partic participants, borne out by our findings with respect to being in community and how that improved their well-being. However, it did not stop with their own personal well-being, and this really impressed and challenged us. Nearly everyone we spoke to felt that they had been changed as, as a person through participating in these communities, and they wanted to pass this on. We have called this fruits, with its biblical resonance of lives transformed, which results in changed behaviour. Sarah explained it like this. I like to help other people. I would go out of my way to help somebody if I see them. People look to you for a little bit of physical support, you know, so that to be a Christian means I've got to give something back, give something of myself. And she then went on to give a powerful explanation of hope, which resonates with Bosch's more comprehensive understanding of salvation. She said, hope for me is being able to reach out to people who are less fortunate than myself because I've been saved from the sort of squalid lives I might have had previously, my younger adolescence. Being saved like that, you've got to pass on the hope. Gary from the Classic Car community expressed how his own personal restoration has meant that he's able to help others. He said, well, me personally, this is honestly the restoration of me has again in turn helped the group. Because what personally I hope is that I can possibly help another person. And he related a very moving story of a work colleague who told him that he wanted to top himself. And Gary replied to this colleague, that ain't the way. And then all of a sudden, I started trying to talk to him. I told him about my problems and my issues. And he was crying in front of me. But at the end of that, he went, I can't believe what you've just done. I haven't done anything. I've just told you about me, and you've told me about you. And I said, do you feel better? Do I? I do. And from there on in, he's been a friend. But if it wasn't for this community, things like that in my life, so you can see how it's made a difference. And by being a part of the sewing collective, Sarah grew in self-confidence. 
she was able to help others and she'd found hope that she wanted to share. For Gary, being part of the classic, part of the classic car community has helped him likewise to grow in confidence and to be able to share about his own restored life so that he could help others and literally save a life. Gary passionately believes that the classic car communities make the world a better place. He said there's more communities starting to go around the country and if it can be hosted by people that help to run and build, then the world's going to be just that little bit of a better place to be in. So those stories do indeed seem to meet Bosch's criterion of salvation meeting the needs and exigencies of human existence. So these are examples of the transformation leading to changed attitudes and actions. But there was also inner and personal transformations. Sam and Gareth in the boxing community expressed their inner transformation as a kind of inner peace and an inner confidence. Sam said, for me, that's what it was just, you just feel like you're a better person. You're, you're kinder to others. You don't, you're not, I can't put it into words. Like, you're not uptight with situations. You're, you're more relaxed and you actually listen to people rather than just sticking to your own opinion. Gareth reflected, I used to be really hot-headed. Everything used to be around, no matter who it's with or what it's about. And in coming here, it's chilled me out. Gary from the classic car community said something similar in that he used to be really brash, a more self-centered person, and that this change has enabled him to help others and to be less self-centered. Perhaps Mark from the boxing community sums it up. You know me, just try to be the best person you can be. None of us are perfect. You're never going to be the best person all the time. But it allows you or a bit more breathing space so you can think about things more and try to be, you know, more level-headed about things and then also be more Christian about it as well. We thought that, on reflection, that was quite a doctrinal statement. We see allusions in there to grace, to forgiveness and redemption, to compassion, to sanctification and discipleship. He also alludes to issues of vulnerability, self-worth, and an honest and realistic assessment of the human condition. How can this not be salvation? Salesian priest and theologian from India, Father Sebastian Caro Temporal, expresses Mark's ideas similarly. He says salvation consists in the gradual transformation of the inner person into the image and likeness of the creator to an authentic humanity. This is a gradual and lifelong process. Here is the ground for the unity of the human vocation, salvation and fulfillment. So this account of the fruits of salvation further demonstrates the ways in which a communal salvation is experienced, is meaningful and brings about change. But there is still a need to tackle the question about the place of confession and articulation of faith. Theologians may be happy to name this as Christ's work experienced implicitly, but as we continued to reflect on these communities, there was a niggling question of whether much of this was the language of a contemporary well-being culture rather than an explicitly Christian one. After all, the language that many of the participants were turning to was about having a better and more balanced life, healthy routines, personal health, being a better person, and being more generous. These are not exclusive to Christianity and would generally be seen as good throughout contemporary British culture. It could also be argued that these qualities do not easily map on to Christianity throughout history. After all, it would be difficult to argue that the desert mothers and fathers prioritised a balanced life or personal health in the way it's articulated here. So one clear trend in the data which is culturally rooted is a strong emphasis on authenticity, being real with each other. This subjective turn in religion is a fascinating subject, but the key point here is not so much 
is not so much how religious participation in late modernity is a culturally rooted phenomenon, but to ask about the implications of this subjective language for a communal soteriology. Interestingly, the leaders of some of these fresh expressions were cautious about letting us talk to their communities about salvation because it was not language they had used and they thought that it might be alienating. So on one level, this is good and right that they should care for those they work with in a pastoral role, but perhaps it also revealed what Pass and Schaefer describe as a theological embarrassment about salvation. Paul, who set up and leads the boxing community, talked about his regret at using the word conversion in some previous publicity about the community and turned instead to a language of journey and process, adding value, bringing peace, offering words of comfort. Rather than conversion, he began to see the divine in other people. Wendy, reflecting on the Forest Church group, which she helps to lead, identified that these changes, she said that these changes identified above are not articulated in Christian terms within that community. And she states, the one criticism I think I would have about this project or this community is that, I mean, the families call it church and we open the prayer and it's gentle witness but there's nobody really identifying that there's nobody, including me, making these links between transformation and Jesus, you know, or pointing out where the Holy Spirit is moving. Wendy can see changes and identify them as because of God, but the group is not comfortable to name that for others. In response, Anna, a curate involved in similar work in another part of the country, asked whether they could pose questions which would encourage people to name the change themselves. This seems to fit with a Monsieur Day approach of fresh expressions, identifying the Spirit's work through listening, reflection and discernment. But in not wanting to impose an interpretation, it may actually be denying them the language to express it. And lacking this language, it might not be surprising that they would turn to the more familiar language of well-being. For example, Sarah resists salvation language. I want to be that close to Jesus and prayer in my life that, I, you know, I don't feel like I need saving, but I'm just one of those people that, you know, he's looking out for, really. She reframes it as looking out for, looking out for each other. Similarly, Sam, when trying to express what he means about being a better person, says, I can't put it into words, but talks about being relaxed and listening to others. So this shows that while articulation is not required for salvation, articulation of faith does have a role to play. Mark McIntosh, an Episcopal priest and theologian, might be off to help us here. He focused on seeing theology and spirituality as integrated through the mystics. He describes spirituality as the impression of the encounter with God on the community and theology as the expression of that encounter. And he describes the separation of spirituality and theology as debilitating and how both ideally serve each other. Theology needs to be rooted in the experience of the community, but spirituality similarly needs theology to move experience from some private devotional or personal encounter to become meaningful for the community. He notes, the problem with the separation from theology is that it tends to disorientate spirituality, to deprive it of some stable communal goal and reference and hence render it susceptible to the idle compulsions or fears of the individual. The communities in this research might be nervous about imposing meaning on experience, but Macintosh highlights that without the language to enable articulation, the community is undermined, reverting to individual experience subject to the individual's own virtues and, vice, virtues and vices rather than being drawn into the bigger story of Christian tradition. Confession of faith might be unnecessary for salvation, 
but an ability to articulate the communal experience becomes necessary for maintaining and sharing a communal soteriology. The turn to prayer. It was surprising to us, and I'm not exactly sure why, but it was surprising to us to find just how important prayer was to the participants. For Sam, prayer at the end of the boxing sessions resonated with him. Gareth was intrigued and drawn in by prayer, and how the prayers in the boxing club related to their lives in contrast to standard church-going prayers was key for Ben. Gary looked forward to the prayer at the end of the classic car meetings and actually started offering to pray for others at work. And for Sarah, prayer was associated with being close to Jesus. She prays daily. North American theologian Andrew Root suggests that the turn to the imminent, to resources and programs, has been the key problem for churches and means that divine action is pushed into the background. He suggests teaching people to pray is one of the key roles of the pastor, bringing divine focus, bring the focus back to divine action. He states, in prayer, we come to see that God, that this God is a minister who shares in our lives by caring for us. The way in which prayer has been valued and taken up by those in these communities is absolutely fascinating and is a clear example that what is going on is beyond a simply well-being emphasis. English theologian Ashley Coxworth in her Systematic Theology of Prayer explores Avagrius' assertion that prayer is the mind's conversation with God, which Coxworth asserts, uh, suggests at the centre of all existence is deep dialogue with the divine. And while rooting that conversation, while noting that conversation as a metaphor, picked up again and again in the tr Christian tradition, prayer can't be said to map nicely onto human conversation. Rather than a neat back and forth, it's instead a messy polyphony of voices intersecting with each other. But given that those prayers are both given by Christ and that Christ prays in the person praying, he asserts that to pray truly is to be caught up in the Son's eternal conversation with the Father. This articulation of prayer further serves our thesis of a communal salvation, as prayer becomes the way in which the relationships of welcome and participation are valued and drawn into communion. So what we are seeing in the practice of these communities is a holistic understanding of life, and therefore salvation. Salvation is not compartmentalized into moments, actions, or practices, but is integrated right throughout the life of the community. It's experienced by the individuals and in their relationships with one another. Prayer is one way in which the community opens these relationships up to encounter Jesus. Malawian missiologist Tavi Kuyani critiques Western approaches to evangelism, asking why so much time is spent on strategy and so little time on prayer. What we see from these groups is that prayer does not simply prepare the way, but is a key means of participation. The significance of prayer for the participants suggests that it is at the heart of what it means to be a fresh expression and at the heart of a communal soteriology. So, to conclude, who then can be saved? Just as the rich young ruler's assumptions behind his question were challenged, perhaps we too need to think about this question differently. Our aim has been to explore a lived soteriology for fresh expressions through paying close attention to the experience of members of fresh expressions. Hopefully we've demonstrated the ways in which the accounts reveal a communal soteriology. This soteriology is mediated through participation and conversation and bears fruit in changed lives, perspectives, relationships and actions. We suggested that bringing this experience of soteriology to articulation is important for the communal sharing of this experience. Not because people need to know or confess things to be saved, but because the communal soteriology itself 
is served by such an articulation. And we've shown how the emphasis on prayer is integral to this communal soteriology, helping to give it a transcendent and eschatological perspective. And we believe that by articulating a lived communal soteriology, this then offers a fresh, fresh perspective on the ecclesiology of fresh expressions. Pass and Schaefer suggest that community building and discipleship are two sides of the same soteriological coin. And we might tentatively assert that the communities in this research are becoming places where they meet Christ through meeting together and that they are changed through these encounters. Through these communities and their practices, the encounter with Christ is mediated in the relationships with one another and the relationships with one another are enriched and deepened because of their encounter with Christ. The temptation when turning to an ecclesiology of fresh expressions is to say what needs to be added to make this church, be this the sacraments, the preaching of the word, or through developing the four marks of the church. But in these communities, we have seen these things emerging through the encounters with one another. The participants did not hesitate to call these communities their church because of these meaningful encounters. Eating together becomes the breaking of bread together. Baptism becomes the natural expression of finding this better version of oneself and having encountered Jesus. The word is shared because questions are asked and stories are explored. These communities are experienced as graced as sacramental. To think that somehow it becomes church by adding something to it is to miss the work of the spirit in their midst. For us, the biggest question is how the articulation of a communal soteriology can happen, not that just at the level of an academic paper or presentation, but within these communities. We want to see a communal soteriology that enables these things to become further shared with one another and with those who find themselves welcomed and drawn into these relationships, these communities of salvation. Thank you for listening.